Our text this morning comes from the epistle of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. These are the words of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray, as we just sang, that you would keep us steadfast in your word. And we pray that as, you, uh, as your word is proclaimed, that you, by your spirit, would apply it to our hearts, that we would grow in grace and in glory, uh, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and that as we, as we hear your word preached, we would grow by it and become more like your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Uh, we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So one bit of housekeeping is that next Sunday, we're going to, between all the congregations, we're going to do a bit of a round robin. Um, so uh, I'll be preaching at the Uptown service. Pastor Toby Sumter will be joining us from King's Cross. He'll be preaching here at the downtown service. Uh, Pastor Wilson will be at the Troy service preaching, and uh, Jared Longshore will be preaching at uh, King's Cross. So uh, if you're keeping score for next week or looking ahead, um, that's, that's the plan for next Sunday. So we're looking forward to um, doing that uh, every so often and between our various congregations to rotate through and, and stay on the same page and be rowing together um, as we are very blessed um, with, the, with the ministers that God has, has filled our, our, our city with. So as we look at this text and as we celebrate this day, this Reformation Day, uh, one of the things that we should keep in mind um, is that the Reformation was a recovery of the gospel of grace. Uh, what we celebrate um, and when we celebrate the Reformation, and rightfully so, we're, recovering, we're, we're celebrating a recovery of something glorious, something that wasn't, um, in, it wasn't an innovation back in the 1500s. It was a recovery of the grace that had been once delivered to the saints in which throughout uh, Christian history, it was the task of the church to preserve and to proclaim. The Reformation really was a recovery of this gospel of grace. And this, this gospel is that not by the merit of saints, uh, or the good works which you or others have done on your behalf, or the penance paid into the coffers, not by any of those things, by the free grace of God are you saved. And by the free grace alone are you saved. Nothing that you've done, not of, not of good that I've done, it's, as the old hymn says, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. But in every age... Various attempts are made to cloud and obscure and encumber this doctrine and bury this glorious doctrine in, in, in a variety of ways. And I hope to touch on some of those later on. Uh, we even just sang, if you notice that, that first verse of that song we just sang, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who fain by craft and sword would wrest the kingdom from thy son and set at naught all that he hath done. And so it's the duty, it's the church's duty to proclaim and defend this glorious gospel of God's free grace through all ages. And there will, there will certainly be variety of ways in which um, our enemy would seek to twist and to warp and to deceive um, as, as, as regards what it means that God has shown his grace to us. And so we must remain steadfast. And, and, in, and in many respects, this passage before us is one of the clearest distillations of the glorious gospel of God's grace to us. And what we, what, we re, what we celebrate, what we believe, what we proclaim, and what was recovered in the Reformation. So in this prologue uh, in Ephesians, Paul gives us the gospel message undiluted. The blessed God has poured out heavenly blessings upon us in Christ there in verse 3, we see that the, blessed be God the Father. He is, he's the, the fountain of all blessing and glory and joy. And it's from him, from this, this blessed God, who has blessed us, poured out all of his blessings upon us. And the only way that those blessings are made available to us and are experienced by us is by our union in Christ. We are united in Christ. These blessings are poured out upon us through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
This blessing is not, of course, haphazard. It's not God willy-nilly. It's not God throwing uh, a, a, a darts at a dartboard. This blessing is according God's uh, predestination. God, this, this doctrine of God's sovereign election is not some willy-nilly thing or haphazard um, uh, sort of thing. It's according to his eternal purpose. Uh, before the world began, and this purpose of God is that those to whom he would uh, choose, those he would choose, those he would predestinate, those he would call, that they might be holy. We see that in verse 4. This predestination then is not a predestination unto do whatever you want, but it's being called out from the wickedness of the world and being called to be holy, to be set apart, to be counted amongst God's people, those that are like Christ. We see that in verse 4. And not only that, but that we, he called us out that we might be holy, but also without blame. All blame is lifted away from us. Satan, the accuser, the one who would come and blame and lay, uh, lay our shame at our feet, Satan's accusation then is answered with the simple childlike answer that we find there in verse 4, that this is all uh, because of his love, that we, are whole, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, that the love that he poured out upon us, that he deigned to set upon us through no deserving of our own, that we might answer all of our, uh, our guilty conscience and all the accusation of the devil, um, all of our burden, all of our shame, all of our blame is lifted off of us because we can see that Christ has shown his love to us, that God has poured out his love upon us through Jesus. And so it really is as simple, it's that Sunday school answer, it really is as simple as Jesus loves me. He he has shown his love unto me. And so our holiness and our blamelessness that it's describing there in verse 4 is brought about by his predestinating our adoption by Jesus unto himself. Unto himself. And so the work that Jesus Christ did in, in redeeming us, his life of obedience, um, the incarnation, his life of obedience, his death upon the cross, his burial, his, his rising again, his ascension, all of this, all the work of Jesus was to bring about our adoption unto the Father. And so Paul is laying the groundwork for all these glorious truths that he's going to build upon in the, in the book of Ephesians. Um, that we are brought from um, out, of, out of the darkness and the sin and the decay of this world, we are brought into the light and the glory and the life of God's household. And this is all according to God's good pleasure. This is a flowing from God's sheer joy in himself and in his purpose. We see that in verse 5, that all of this was according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, nobody got God's arm behind his back and forced him to do these things. All of this, all of his kindness to you, all the grace and the gospel that has been proclaimed to you, which you've believed and received by faith, is all of it from top to bottom, side to side, is grace upon grace to you. And so... This results, as we're told, as Paul explains, this results to the praise of the glory of his grace. All this results in praise to the glory of his grace, as displayed by him taking enemies and making them friends, by taking strangers and transforming them into beloved sons. Uh, we, we touched on this a couple months ago. We went through the How God Builds series, and we, ta- and we looked at uh, chapter 2, where Paul says this in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And then in verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And so Paul is is, is preparing to make the case and explain to both Jewish and Gentile believers that this grace that has been shown, that you've been quickened, you've been uh, saved by grace through faith, as we read in chapter 2 as well, that Christ has taken um, Gentiles and brought them into the household of God. And God is uniting Jew and Gentile together into one household. And all of it is through the redeeming work of Christ, that he's able to take those that were far off, those that were strangers, those that were enemies, those who were at odds with God, and God has transformed his enemies into friends, these strangers into sons, that they might enjoy the blessing of being counted and named and numbered amongst God's people, be be sons in the household of God. 
And I think that then explains later on in the book of Ephesians why Paul goes out of his way to give really clear instruction as to how our households are to be ordered and structured in regards to his instructions to husbands and wives and children and slaves and masters. All of that is built upon the fact of how God built his house, how God has welcomed us who were once far off and brought us into the household of faith, this house that God is building with living stones. And so God is, through Christ, has taken those who were once far off, those who were once enemies and strangers, and made us beloved sons. We see that in verse 6. And all this is to the praise of his glory. And so then in verse 7, we have a summary, a simple summary of this gospel. And it can be summarized in this way. By the redeeming blood of Christ, Christ the God-man, Christ the one who lived a perfect life, by the redeeming blood of Christ, our sins are forgiven. I love that every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, we, we have a moment in our service, in our liturgy, where we proclaim this simple, uh, plain gospel truth that your sins are forgiven through Christ. This is the declaration that the gospel makes to us, is that though we are sinners, though we are red as scarlet, though our sins are dark as midnight, Christ, God through Christ, has forgiven your sins. And so the right response to that, of course, from the congregation is praise be to God, thanks be to God. And this is what Paul is getting at. To the praise of his glory, to the glory of his grace. All of this, these mysterious purposes of God to call us out, to show his grace to us, all of it is to result in praise, honor, and glory to him. By the blood of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. There in verse seven. Furthermore, God can do all this. God can forgive our sins. Why? And Paul gives us this answer. How can these things be? How can this, how can this good news be true? How can it be that God would, would look at sinful man and pardon him and forgive him? How can this be? And the answer in verse 7 is that it's all according to the riches of his grace. Now, grace is one of those words that's thrown around throughout Christian circles. It's one of those Christianese that you just sort of think you know what it means. It's, it, it can be one of those that we um, throw around a lot but don't have a, a good working definition for in our mind. Now, this, this free grace is often scandalous. Mankind wants to, wants to think that he can somehow earn his way into God's good graces, that if he's good enough, if he gives enough to the poor, if he does enough good works, if he shows up at church with his hair combed and in his right mind and with his tie nice and straight, that somehow God will be pleased with his works. And so this scandal of grace is that God has shown you kindness, has shown you favor, has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light because of nothing you did. You brought your nothing. You didn't have anything but your garbage and your sin and your shame, and God showed his grace to you and washed it all clean, not because you begged enough, not because you did enough good works, not because you climbed some mountain or swam some ocean, but because God showed his favor to you. He gave you ears to hear, eyes to see. He gave you a new heart to believe these things, to set your eyes on Christ. That is the scandal of free grace. And, and, and of course, um, sinful man and the devil and the world, that won't do. And so there's attempt after attempt to obscure this glorious gospel, to, to confuse what this grace really is and what it means. Grace, very simply put, is favor. It is God's favor upon us. But God's favor is not just some intangible notion that, that lives in some floaty philosophical place, some realm of ideas. After all, when we look at the story of Scripture, what do we see? We see that God's favor makes the barren woman bear a child in old age. Think of uh, Rachel where it says in Genesis 30. It says of Rachel, uh, that, uh, verse, uh, Genesis 30, verse 22, and God remembered Rachel and hearkened to her and opened her womb. So when God's favor is, is displayed, a barren woman bears a child. Or as we saw when we went through the book of Ruth, God shows his favor to Ruth and Naomi. And behind all the, the workings of that mysterious story, we saw, we saw God bringing about a son for Naomi to be her kinsman redeemer. 
God shows his favor, and suddenly the barren woman bears a child. God shows his favor and delivers a nation of slaves out of, out of Egypt. We see that in the story of the Exodus. God places his favor upon his people and gives revelation to the proper worship of the living God. Deuteronomy 4.33, as God is explaining to the people through Moses uh, his, his kindness to them, what, what he's done. Uh, one of my favorite uh, descriptions of God's uh, covenant mercies, uh, Deuteronomy 4.33, says this, Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and lived? Or has God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? So God takes hold of Israel and brings them out, and then reveals to them the pattern for right worship of the living God. He brings them out, his favor is set upon them, and he brings them out and displays to them the proper worship, the order for proper worship of the living God in the the tabernacle and the the temple and the the sacrificial system. That God brings them out and then shows them uh, his grace by giving them this sacrificial system that they might be assured that their sins are covered, that they're in union with the living God. He is their covenant king. God's favor sends down heavenly manna and makes water spring from rocks. As the psalmist describes the wilderness wanderings, that God's favor is upon Israel such that manna falls from heaven, uh, water springs from rocks. This favor routs armies of giants. This favor topples Jericho's walls. When God places his favor upon either an individual, as in Noah and Abram, David and Solomon, or a nation, as we see in Israel's story throughout the Old Testament. One of the things that you should remark upon, one of the things you should see clearly, is that when God places his favor, things are not left as they once were. So when we see God giving the law to Moses, and then Moses asks to see God's glory, And in that episode, the Lord, the lawgiver, declares his character. In in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Moses asks to see God's glory, and God reveals his glory. The lawgiver shows his glory and describes it in these terms. And the Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And so in God's revelation to Moses, God the lawgiver, revealing his glory unto Moses, God describes his glory in terms of his mercy, his grace, his long-suffering, that his favor has been set upon them, and that through all these sacrificial ordinances, they might be assured that their iniquities are forgiven. But at the same time, within that description, God assures us that he is still just, that he will punish the guilty, that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon their children. So that God, as as Paul picks up on in Romans, that God might be the judge and the justifier of those that come to him by faith. This is God's glory, that he shows his favor to his people, and that favor does not leave things the way they are. God's glory is declared in his graciousness to mankind. And remember, this is nestled, this revelation of God's glory, that his glory is found in this graciousness, this mercy, this long-suffering to sinners. This glory is nestled in the context of God establishing a nation, God becoming the covenant head of this nation, God establishing his covenant mercies with Israel. God, the lawgiver, preparing us to see Christ, the law keeper, on our behalf. 
God's favor is placed upon Israel through no goodness of their own. God places his favor upon them, and then God rearranges Israel, calls them out of Egypt, messes things up, rearranges the furniture, and he does all this because God's favor has been set upon them. Think, too, of the story of Jacob. God's favor rested upon Jacob from his mother's womb. It's that famous line. Many a pregnant woman has probably uh, felt this way, that description where Rebecca, she has twins in her womb, Jacob and Esau, and her famous line, if it be, if it be so with me, why am I thus? One of those great King James-isms. Like, why am I having such a hard time with this pregnancy? And the prophecy comes that the elder shall serve the younger, that God's favor was upon Jacob from his earliest days, that his favor was placed upon Jacob. And thus Jacob he, he receives the birthright from Esau, and then he wisely procures the blessing from his father, Isaac. And then Esau is enraged and, and tries to kill Jacob, and, and as Jacob is fleeing, God promises his favor to go with Jacob, to sustain Jacob, to, to be upon Jacob in all of his wanderings. God promises at Bethel to protect Jacob in his wanderings. We see that in Genesis 28. God says this to, to Jacob as he's uh, heading to Padan Aram, where, his, his, uh, where, where Laban is. 28.15, God says to Jacob, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so, God goes with Jacob. His grace is upon him. His favor is upon him. God blesses him with wives and children and flocks and herds. And then upon Jacob's return, that, that interesting episode where God comes to wrestle with Jacob. This, too, is the display of God's favor. And we know that because of how the episode ends. It is a grace to wrestle with God. Because when God places his favor upon us, he calls us out and he rearranges our life. He turns it all upside down and inside out. He refuses to let us stay in our sin, in our corruption, in our wickedness. And so he turns it all inside out. It is a favor, it is a grace to wrestle with God. How else did Jacob get his new name, Israel? Jacob effectively means the, the one who wrestles with man, while Israel effectively means the one who wrestled with God. And God proclaims to Jacob, you've now wrestled with man and with God and have prevailed. And so God's favor rested upon Jacob from his mother's womb until the end of his story. This favor rested upon Jacob. It upheld him. It protected him. And it came to name him. It came to define him. God sustained him through his whole story that God might receive the glory for Jacob's life for, and, and make him a true Israel. And so the story of biblical history is God repeatedly coming in grace to mankind and revealing his great purpose to restore man to the glory of God's presence, to bring the, wander, the man who had fled from him in Eden to restore man to his presence. But when God comes down, when God comes in, when God shows his favor, he does not come down to simply leave things put. God's grace rearranges the furniture. The presence of God, his sweet favor being poured upon his people, brings about the, great, the greatest moments of redemptive and covenant history. Think about it. When you think about the, the warp and the woof of Old Testament history, his favor is set upon Noah. And what happens next? The world is flooded and remade. His favor is set upon David, and the Philistine giant is toppled, and the army is put to flight. When God's favor comes, when God's grace is shown, armies of giants are put to flight, the world is remade, grace upon grace. Any of you who have coached youth sports or have had your kids in, in sports, um, you've, you've seen this in action in, in a miniature and sort of a shadowy form. Think about when, when a son spots his dad on the sidelines or up in the stands, cheering his heart out for his son, saying, your, 
Way to go, kid. Way to go, champ. Get at it, tiger. That sort of thing. When a, when a son spots his dad cheering for him in the stands, what happens to the, to the little boy? The boy stands a little taller. He runs a little faster. He grits his teeth a bit harder. All of this, that the change in the son is brought about because his father's favor is upon him. God's favor has been shown to us through Christ. It is a glorious gospel of grace. It is a sweet grace. And because this grace has been shown to us, things cannot stay the way they are, individually or corporately or for the whole world. God is turning things upside down. This is a sweetness. Grace is sweet, but not like what some would make it out to be, like a two-pound bag of gummy bears collected from trick-or-treating that leaves you sick in the end. Uh, think of it more like the sugar which activates the yeast in your dough, which in one sense, the, the, the yeast on its own is incapable of doing anything. It's, it's dead. It's lifeless in a sense. But when it's, a, when it's a activated, when it's been uh, activated by sugar or, or honey, the yeast gets to work. It's, it's made alive. And this is the gospel of grace, that you are dead. It's not that you need to get 99% of the way and then God will help you over the finish line. It's that you are dead. You are lifeless. But when the grace of God is shown to you, your eyes are open. Your heart is made new. Your ears hear the gospel and believe, and you believe by grace. Apart from grace, you are damned. You are dead. You are lifeless. But when God, by his eternal purpose, when he shows grace to you, when he calls you out, you are brought to life. You are justified. You are forgiven. You are reckoned as righteous in God's sight. And that grace that God shows to us through Christ begets in us, begets in you, life, true life, Christ's life by his Holy Spirit that dwells in you. And so that first sight of grace is, of course, the root and the foundation of our hope. That were it not for Christ, were it not for God's kindness to me, I would not have come. And now that I have seen Christ in his goodness towards me, that he would stand in my stead and, and be reckoned by God as a sufficient sacrifice for my sin. And not only that, but that he's been raised into new and eternal life by the power of God, all in my stead, taking me with me, taking me with him to the Father's right hand. That first sight of grace is the root and the foundation of our hope, but it is the continued gaze upon God's glorious grace, which of course alone is, is the way to bring about the fruit of holiness, the fruit of the Spirit. Grace is what opens your eyes, and grace is what keeps your eyes steadfast upon the Christ who sought you and bought you. But as with anything good, the sinful man and Satan would love to twist and to warp and to deceive. John Newton once really poignantly said that Satan will preach free grace when he finds people willing to believe the notion as an excuse and a cloak for idleness. Let me read that again. Satan will preach free grace when he finds people willing to believe the notion as an excuse and a cloak for idleness. Paul addressed the same issue way back in the book of Romans. Paul warns in his famous rhetorical question, should we sin so that grace may abound? If this good news be so good that God is a forgiver of sins, should we go ahead and sin so that grace may abound? And of course, Paul's famous response is, God forbid. We don't sin so that grace may abound. We don't use free grace as a cloak for our own idleness, as a cloak to indulge our carnal desires. But regardless of such warnings against this mindset, many Christians continue to operate under a misguided assumption about what grace is and what it does. And this is what was recovered in the Reformation that it wasn't your good works that saved you, it was the free grace of God alone. And what resulted from that gospel was an outburst of good works, was, was a, a 
an orchard that began to grow of God's, of God's people getting active and busy, uh, feeding the poor, caring for the needy, proclaiming the gospel, um, a restoration of home life and marriage. There was all sorts of glorious fruits that resulted from this proclamation of the grace of God in Christ. So amidst the many ways that the clear glass of grace is clouded over with the doctrine of men is a recent tendency in modern evangelicalism to, in one way, absolutize this doctrine of adoption which is described here in our text. Our text describes our salvation in some interesting terms. It uses the term of adoption to describe our being adopted into God's household, to describe our salvation as an adoption into God's household. But modern and more recent articulations and presentations of this doctrine of adoption have turned this doctrine from a glory to a grief. Being adopted as sons by the Heavenly Father has been turned into more, something more like a kidnapping by, uh, and then being pampered by a wet nurse who denies no treat to the spoiled heir. But rather than being brought into God's house and being given God's spirit to work the works of faith, to, to uh, be, be, get, be quickened for the good works which he's prepared in advance for us to do, it's turned into a, an indulgent wet nurse that denies no treat, that pampers and coddles and says, it's all right, just it's okay that you're still sinful, it's okay that you're still living and, and still wrestling with that thing and still um, uh, indulging that, that sinful appetite and still walking that way, that's okay, it's okay, it's okay, grace, 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 grace. But that's not what the grace of God is declared to be in Scripture. Grace is not the indulgence of God the Father of our sinful lusts. Grace begets a new nature within us. Grace, uh, it's because the Father has adopted us and made us partakers of his nature. Many want grace to just be this sort of covering over and, and turning a blind eye to sin. But what grace is, is it's God's favor adopting us, bringing us into his home. And it's beyond just our, our sort of earthly understanding of what an adoption is, where it's a biologically uh, distinct child. Uh, you, you have no biological connection with the child, but you adopt them into your home and you, you give them your name. This adoption described in scripture is, goes beyond that, where the child actually receives a new nature. Grace restores nature. It doesn't turn a blind eye to our sinful nature. It restores us to as we ought to have been in Eden. It doesn't indulge our fallen nature. Our adoption into the household of God is not a permission slip to remain in sin, to remain as enemies of the Almighty. Our adoption is a change of generation, a change of fatherhood. The Westminster Confession of Faith explains this doctrine of adoption this way. I want to read the whole the section in whole. All those that are justified, God vouchsafeth in and for his only son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption. And what does that adoption do? By which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. They have his name put upon them. They received the spirit of adoption. They have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as by a father, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. Notice that language, chastened but never cast off. You were given the name of Christ, and as such, the Father will protect and provide for you, but also chasten you, cleanse you. He's given you his spirit, which is at work within you, to cleanse out all remaining corruption, to drive out and expose the areas in which you need to be further sanctified and made holy. But though he chastens you, he will never cast you out. And he will bring you at last into the, ever, into the promised inheritance, your everlasting salvation. Another kind of uh, accompanying feature of, of this sort of up, upending of the gospel of grace to make it an indulgence of sinful desires uh, 
one of the common features that many descendants of the Calvinist heritage have is to then think of um, man's, the doctrine of man's total depravity as a description, as a normative description of the Christian post-conversion. I call it the, the woe is me Calvinism that wants to take total depravity as the description of the, the rest of the Christian's life. And while we, we confessed in, our, in the Heidelberg Catechism that our good works are always going to be tainted by some level of remaining corruption, the gospel which was recovered in the Reformation points out that the grace which was shown to us brings us truly alive and gives us grace to go about good works which the Father, in fact, receives joyfully. And though, yes, they're tainted with our sin and our pride and our shame, they're not, the, they're not descriptive uh, as, as sin and shame any longer because we've been made new. Instead of moaning over or coddling our sinfulness, the gospel of grace gives us hope that we are not only reckoned as righteous in our justification, but we are empowered by the Spirit to walk in true holiness in our sanctification. In other words, we aren't left as orphans. We are given a new nature, a new heart, a new spirit is put within you. And this is the glorious gospel of God's grace, that God has showed his favor to you, and in his favor, he's given you, he's made you to be a partaker of his very spirit. This glorious gospel of God's grace is in a major key. And attempts to play it in a minor key are just plain ugly. Have you, have you gone down one of those YouTube rabbit holes where they uh, take like Happy Birthday or Joy to the World or Jingle Bells or you know, some cheery song like that and they play it in a, in a minor key? It's well worth doing if you have a, a slow afternoon sometime. It's worth doing just because of how ugly those inversions of a major key to a minor key are. But this is what we do when we take this glorious gospel of grace and, and somehow turn it into an, a, a, a permission slip to remain in a sort of woe is me Calvinism, in a sort of God just turns a blind eye to my sin. God is just a permissive father, an indulgent father, rather than seeing it as this glorious gospel that it is, that God, through no deserving of my own, has set his favor upon me, saved me because of the redeeming work, justifying work of Christ, and now has given me his spirit that I might walk in true holiness. And here's the wonder of it all, that when we go about the good works, as Paul says later in Ephesians, the good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do, do you know what God the Father says of the good works of the saints? those that have come to him by faith, those whom he's adopted. He looks at our good works as feeble and as faltering as they are, and God delights in them for the sake of Christ. As we offer it all up to him in faith. As Paul puts it in our text, this glorious gospel of grace, this your salvation results in praise to the glory of his grace. As he calls it elsewhere, this is the glorious gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. This is the glorious gospel of the blessed God, 1 Timothy 1.11. The glorious gospel of grace is this then, the gospel that was recovered in the Reformation, the gospel which we are called to proclaim in our day and age without flinching, without failure, without uh, faltering. This is the gospel that is proclaimed by the church through all ages. God has set his favor upon you, not because of anything good in you, not because your tie is straight or your hair looks good or because you've, done, you've had a pretty good week this week, but only by the goodness of Christ in your stead. God looks at you in Christ, by Christ, and because of Christ, and says of you, righteous, justified, forgiven. Now we can oftentimes comprehend the judge would look at a, at a sinner, a guilty criminal, and say, you know what, bucko, you've really blown it again, but we're going to we're going to forgive you. We're going to let you go free. You, you blew it again, but we're going to forgive you. But the gospel we proclaim is that God looks upon you, guilty sinner that you are, God looks at you in Christ and says, not guilty, righteous, justified, free, clean. And not only that, but you are my son or daughter and now has given us his own spirit that he might work in us the good works which he's called us to do. You would not have come had he not drawn you. 
You would not believe had he not given you a new heart. He has set his grace, his favor upon you, and this grace just will not leave you as you are. By grace, your eyes are opened to see Christ, and by grace, the glory of Christ holds your gaze, and by grace, you shall one day say with the hymn writer, my hope shall change to glad fruition, my faith to sight, and my prayer to praise. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this glorious gospel of grace. We thank you that through no doing of our own, through no righteousness of our own, though our good works were like filthy rags in your sight, by the grace which you've shown to us through Christ, you now reckon us as righteous. And not only that, but you don't leave us the way we are. Your favor bestows upon us your very nature. that We we are made partakers of your spirit. Your spirit is at work within us, cleansing out the inward corruption that we might walk in true holiness and be blameless in your sight. Lord, we thank you for all this glorious grace that you've shown to us. And we now sing back to you the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, There's a common tendency for mankind to desire unity, but to seek for it outside of God himself. Ecumenical movements try to thread a needle and appear united under some generic Christless spirituality. Politicians bloviate about finding common ground. The media chant their familiar mantras about how we all need to come together. Well, let me break some news. We have here in this sacrament what they all want. The saints have unity. We are made one with our head, and we are one body with each other. The same spirit dwells in the whole. It isn't a divided spirit, but the Holy Spirit who unites us to Christ our head. But this unity is the result of a broken and bloody Christ. This is the only basis for true unity. And by this union, we become more and more like Christ, shunning our sins ever more vehemently, laboring all the more earnestly to do God-glorifying works, and seeking to keep the unity which Christ's Spirit has imparted to us. The truth we confess at this table is that of a whole Christ. He is ascended bodily to the Father's right hand. He is the head of the church, and as such, His spirit fills all in all. This means for each of us that you aren't left to live a Christian life without Christ. You live out the Christian life because he has joined you to himself and to his body, and he sent forth his spirit to dwell dwell richly in you and every other saint. And because he dwells in us richly, our songs are loud, our praise is hearty, Our joy in him and our fellow saints is overflowing. The only point of unity for mankind is to come here. Come to Christ. Come taste the broken bread. Come drink this cup of wine and never more hunger or thirst. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this bread and for this wine, these signs of Christ broken and and his body bloodied upon the cross for the remission of our sins. And we thank you that by this sign, you assure us of our union with you, our Father, through the Spirit, by the blood of Jesus. And not only that, but you unite us with each other by grace. And all of this is is a gift of your kindness and your favor to us. We give thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. The charge is this. Make sure to come out for the... The psalm sing this this afternoon will be great fun to celebrate together and sing together, so don't miss that. And then meditate on this. God's grace has been extended to you. And you might say, well, how do I know? How do I know that God has shown his grace to me? Well, simply ask yourself, have you been baptized? Have you heard the word proclaimed? Have you tasted the bread and wine? Well, then you've been shown grace upon grace. This favor cannot leave things as they were. And so go forth to walk in this grace, knowing that your sins are forgiven. You are reckoned righteous, and Christ's spirit dwells in you richly. And now here with believing hearts and open hands, the benediction of God your Father. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. And amen. Amen.